Hi everyone, um, my name is Mary Magsman. I'm the curator at Aurora Picture Show and we're really happy to have you all joining us tonight for the uh, round 14 presentations of the IDEA Fund recipients. Um, uh, each one of these projects received $5,000 to make their ideas come to life and we can't wait to hear more about them. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the IDEA Fund, we're supported by the Andy Warhol Foundation and we're co-administered with Aurora Picture Show, Diverse Works and Project Row Houses. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Ashley now from Diverse Works and um, she'll continue our introductions. So thanks again for joining us. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Ashley DeHoyas. I'm the curator at Diverse Works. Um, uh, one of the administrators for the IDEA Fund. Uh, before we begin, uh, we'd like to uh, take this moment to respectfully acknowledge the original inhabitants of the land in which we reside. I'm speaking to you from the land currently called Houston. Uh, it lies within the ancestral territories of the Karankwa and the uh, At Ataka, sorry, excuse me. Atacapa Ishak peoples. I also recognize the native peoples that share the Southeast Texas region, region including the Kumokruz, the Tokwa, and the Kulatekan. We acknowledge that this land is occupied, unceded territory, and pay tribute to them. For those of you that would like to do the same based on where you're located, please feel free to introduce yourself and the land that you reside in the chat. I'm gonna pass it to Sydney. Hi everyone, thanks for coming out tonight. Um, my name is Sydney. I am the curatorial assistant and arts coordinator at Project Row Houses. Um, so before we move forward, I do want to take a moment to thank the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts. Without their support, the Idea Fund would not be possible. So we extend immense gratitude for their generosity. I also want to thank our jurors that made round 14 the amazing cohort that it is. Our jurors were artistic director and curator of public engagement at Portland Institute for Contemporary Art, Roya Amir Soleimani, independent curator Leslie Moody Castro, and director of arts and culture for the Fifth Ward Community Redevelopment Corporation and 2019 Idea Fund recipient, Harrison Guy. Each of our jurors selected tonight's grantees with thoughtful consideration and care, and we thank them for the work that they put into the Idea Fund. And with that being said, I will pass it back to Ashley. Okay, and tonight to start us off, off um, each uh, panelist, uh, sorry, each um, Idea Fund grantee will have five minutes to present on their project, and we will begin with Kais Alasali. Next up, we have uh, Banke Abatu uh, in collaboration with Aisha Black, Lou J, uh, Shayna Lynette Smith, and Irina Williams for Project Summon. Hello, everyone. Can you all see me? Hopefully so. I am Banke Awupetu. There are five Black women who have come together for this project summon, and you'll be hearing from them shortly. Um, so I want to start by saying this is the idea fun reception, right? So we're having a reception of our own. I hope you all have something to sip as well, because we are so excited. We're celebrating, and we really just want to bring that true authentic spirit, all the whole gamut of Black womanhood to this project. So um, as a creative, I write from a place of spirit. I is never forced. It's that I'm being used as a vessel and the words are coming through. So I believe in the Holy Spirit and I believe in the spirit of my ancestors. So through this project, 
It was originally um, a collaborative effort with a male artist and we found ourselves at odds. And I felt like the crux of it was sexism, his inability to see my work as being the same level as his own. And so I was speaking with a friend who was um, originally acting in the project and I was just you know, sharing very transparently and she shared that she had had similar experiences. She said, these guys, they can see you as an assistant, but they have a hard time seeing you as an equal. And then we decided to expand the project. So she's an amazing theatrical director, multidisciplinary artist. So I handed the rums over, rums, reins. It's a reception, work with me, okay? <laughs> um, <laughs> I handed the reins over to Shanae, who went on to recruit more of the Black women artists who added that visual element. So I will pass the camera to her. Okay, so yeah, I, I, they can't see me. No, okay. Yes, there we go. So yeah, when I read Banke's work, the words initially struck me in a real personal place. Um, the first line was, "I stand above and below," and that line alone was something that I felt spoke to what it means to be a Black woman and an artist, especially in America, holding this um, or having this call to create for a higher purpose, but still having this position um, in America as this lower being in a way. Um, and then there was another line that really stuck out for me, centuries old rage, no amount of blood you sink. And that really made me think of the lineage of Black women that came before us who probably felt a desire to create, but couldn't. And like, what happens to that rage? What happens to that anger? And also what happens to the sanctity of their art? So we, cre we recruited <laughs> more Black women to join us in this project. Uh, we have Blue, who is acting. And do you want to speak to what draws you to this work? Um, it's the same. I resonate with all the other ladies here. Um, I've, most of my projects in the past have been with males. And so I can definitely uh, see how, how they, I guess how they think, how men think. And I don't like it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't like it. Um, I don't want to be seen as less than uh, when Either when the work that I'm doing is benefiting you or benefiting us, then we should be equals. And so that's why I'm here. And we have our name. Yes. Tell us to the next slide. To the next, could you go to the next slide? Next slide, please. Sure. So we have a short video from Arne. Okay, so that cookie saw kind of alludes to the fact um, that we're working on the fact that black women are worthy. To, um, well, my intention is to kind of steer the visual narrative from a photographic and film standpoint. Um, I'm wanting to just kind of unravel the black woman experience um, in a way and just simply speak to identity. And I'm excited about the project because I feel like all of us have our own unique um, talents and power that we bring to the project. So I'm just here to get started. And then we have Asha. Hi. Next slide, please. There we go. Um, yeah, so... Uh, 
Yeah, I create from a place of expression. I like expressing myself and really, I don't really know what the paintings mean until I experience it, you know? So it's kind of like a visual. And um, I'm excited to be working with a powerful group of women. It's my first experience. So yeah, I hope I help create something to be useful for the world. <laughs> yeah, so a big goal of mine with this project is to tap into those deeper gifts that we all have. So even though everybody is contributing in one way, it's still very open to collaboration and like expression. So if there's something else that you feel you want to give to this project, then you can. Um, and we're going to be interviewing Black women artists around Houston in this process, just to talk to them about their own experiences and like the adversity that they face just breaking in to, I guess you can say the art game. <laughs> um, so yeah. Okay. So thank you all um, to just it's going to be a theatrical production that we capture on film and we document the process and include other Black women artists as well. Everybody that's a part of it is, um, they're all being extremely modest, but they're the best at what they do. I would normally curse, but I don't know how stiff you guys are being during your reception. Love you all and we'll see you when we present again. Thank you. Thank you, ladies, it was wonderful. Uh, next up, we have Gregory Michael Carter, Machine to Retrieve Reparation. Hello, can everyone see me? Darn it. Yes. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, my work this time around is conceptual in nature. I can't really see anyone else, so I'm not sure what's going on with that. But um, if I could have the first slide, please. This gentleman, John Burge, uh, was a corrupt, hello, was a corrupt uh, police chief in the city of Chicago from the 1970s until 1990s. Uh, the city of Chicago paid reparations to the victims of this uh, of this guy. Uh, he tortured over 125 men, him and his affiliates. And in uh, 2015, $5.5 million was, was awarded to the families. They waived the tuition to city colleges in Chicago. And uh, there was supposed to be a memorial built but as of now, it hasn't been built yet. Uh, this is a lot to fit in the five slides. So uh, next slide, please. Here's some examples of my recent work because the rest of the slides have to do with uh, the history surrounding reparations. And like I said, uh, this work is conceptual in nature. So. I really kind of have, you, you kind of have to imagine, you know, what this work looks like. On the left, there's, uh, on the left, there's a work called uh, The Allegory of the Cave. Uh, it was completed, I think, in 2017. It's uh, transfer on papyrus. It has to do with a series of works where I'm creating, uh, I'm creating relics, essentially. The second work in the middle is called Open Even on Christmas, is another line of, is a continuation of, you know, the previous work where I'm creating these paintings on various different substrates to uh, essentially give them a feeling of being modern relics, okay? Uh, the third piece on the right is uh, called um, Shit Was Different When Mike Left and It Was Scotty's Team. 
it is about uh, maybe 11 by 16 inches and it is on slate. So next slide, please. Okay, I'm sure everyone has heard the term 40 acres and a mule. And this term comes from a famous document called the, uh, the Special Field Report for General Sherman. Um, one moment, please. After the end of the Civil War, there was a surrender at Apotomax. 40 acres and a mule. It's, the statement has come to stand for the promises made and broken by the formerly enslaved. But essentially what happened is the land that's denoted here on the, on the right side in South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida was allotted to slaves in 1865. Um, it was also held up by a president at the time, Abraham Lincoln. Next slide, please. Okay, these are some other examples by which the American government uh, awarded reparations to American citizens. First, uh, Japanese internment camps, uh, they were awarded reparations in, excuse me, one second, this is a lot, in 1990, the Civil Liberties Act of 1988. In, this, in the third photo down here, you can see Ronald Reagan signing this act in the law. And then before, a generation before that, um, Native Americans were all, well actually, excuse me, later, excuse me, a generation later, uh, Na Native Americans were awarded lands to the tune of four, 44 million acres in 1971. Uh, so next slide, please. This gentleman, Conrad Adenauer, was the first chancellor of Germany following World War II. And in 1952, he signed the Luxembourg Agreement with Israel and awarded reparations to Israel and uh, citizens affected by the atrocities done by the Third Reich. As of 2012, they've awarded more than $89 billion. Next slide, please. Was that the last slide? Okay, I think that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Gregory. Um, up next, we'll have Sol Diaz uh, presenting their project, The Places I Know. Hey y'all, um, thank you for the opportunity to the Idea Fund. Um, I will be sharing my project, The Place I Know. It involves, it involves the Historic Heights neighborhood in Houston, Texas. So um, next slide. Before I begin, I would like to express respect to Chief Canos of the Orcoquisax people who in protecting the land under his care, which now includes present day heights, um, he successfully played European, Spanish and French powers against each other for many years. The project, um, The Place I Know, is about voice, family and history. Um, I will start with some background. Next slide, please. Um, in 1962, my grandfather, Pablo Diaz, moved his family from Oaxaca, Mexico to Houston, Texas. In 1968, he purchased this house as their home. Um, it used to be all red, 
this was a recent photo I took like two weeks ago. Um, I liked it better when it was all red. Um, <laughs> my uh, grandmother sold it in 2001. Um, the Historic Heights Association is an organization dedicating itself to the quality of life they see fit and appropriate for the neighborhood and historic preservation. In their own timeline retelling, um, the Historic Heights Association uses the words decline and poverty to describe the period of the Heights after white flight in the 1940s before its founding in 1973. I'm going to next share some numbers. In 2000, the median household income in the Heights neighborhood was 41,576. And in 2015, it had more than doubled to over $80,000 being the median household income. The thing about that is that ethnic demographics also shifted during this time. Between the year 2000 and 2015, the Hispanic population decreased from 53% to 34%, and non-Hispanic whites increased from 42% to 58%. I have childhood memories in the Heights, and um, to move back in uh, within these last few years and witness how much it has changed is um, shocking to say the least. Um, next slide, please. So with my project, The Place I Know, um, human engagement is essential. Here's a photo uh, from my summer studios residency with Project Row House in 2018. Um, this is me and uh, third ward resident Roderick um, after we had worked tending to the land uh, by his home, which had been purchased and then neglected by the city of Houston. And he was annoyed. He found me, I was like, cutting the grass <laughs> and so he came and he brought his tools out and yeah we got to know each other and that was part of my project then um so similarly i will be interacting with spaces in the heights neighborhood um established and active from that time period 1940s to present day um, I will interact with the people I find in these spaces um, and with some, you know, ones who are open to it, I will hold interviews. Um, these interviews will ask residents questions about their experiences, their memories and feelings about time, place and the neighborhood in general. Next slide, please. Um, engaging with community members uh, will inspire a series of large scale paintings on paper that will then be presented. Uh, I mean to say wheat pasted uh, along prominent areas of the neighborhoods. These paintings will be no less than 10 feet uh, in one direction. Um, and the location in which I paste these paintings will also be determined by the interviews. Um, I'll be documenting this process throughout and seek to self-publish a book um, centering the project, but also um, the interviews and the people that were a part of this project. Um, next slide, please. So <laughs> I really love this photo. Um, it's a 1980s photograph of the Heights Bike Club um, at Monty Beach Park, which is a park off of Main Street near like kind of the Waterburger and like the Tampico Refresqueria. Um, so inspired by this photo for public programming, I'm going to organize and host um, a bike ride tour and exhibition um, based on this project. Um, so it'll be uh, historical sharing. Um, thank you to Pachuco Sam on Pinterest for this photo. Um, I will post about this project on Instagram, but I would rather those interested in uh, keeping up with it, not rely on the algorithm to keep them updated and in the loop. Um, instead, 
I recommend um, signing up for email updates uh, via the newsletter link on my website. I do believe the moderators will post um, my website on, in the chat. Um, next slide, please. So my motivation in materializing this project is to honor my memories of the neighborhood, counter the erasure of the people that made up the Heights while making space for the voices that are still present. Um, none of this will bring back the homes that needed to relocate. None of this will bring back the structures that were demolished to make room for townhomes. We won't leave quietly. Thank you very much. Thank you, so. Uh, and yeah, Sol's uh, website is in the, in the chat if any of you would like to follow their work. Um, next up, we have Matthew Flores and Angel Lartif with forensic, forensic excavation. Hi. Okay. So I think Angel might have a little bit trouble getting on the video feed right now, but um, I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and start. Um, Hello. So, so this will be a, a visual site specific performance that we're planning to do in, um, oh, you want to do the photo uh, since you're on now? I think I'm on. Could you, could you hear me? Could you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you for Idea Fund to that selected our project. Um, but yeah, um, Matt, I you could keep talking because I just want to know if you guys could see me or. Yeah, so so this project is going to be mainly focused in South Texas and dealing with the uh, the humanitarian migrant crisis down there, where since twenty fourteen at least. 1,750 migrants remains have been found along the border and more than half of those are in Texas and the majority of those are in Brooks County where um, the South Texas Human Rights Center is located where I've been volunteering for a little over a year now with uh, Director Eddie Canales and um, as far as like what our work is going to um, encompass is going to be um, a visual like site specific um, installation in um, in Brooks County and it's going to be also uh, accompanied with a, a chapbook that is going to document it and um, some writings like poetry and experimental writings. Um, um, I'll just talk a, a little bit about um, my background <clears throat> in the project. So this first uh, um, image is a sculpture that um, I constructed um, in El Rincón Social back in 2018. Um, just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about that because that's sort of the direction of how we want to sort of construct this type of site-specific outer in South Texas. <clears throat> in 2018, following the loss of my grandfather, a working class um, migrant from Mexico whose brother disappeared in an attempt to cross the US-Mexico border. I began exploring various burial sites of South Texas, um, just like and um, very um, like antique cemeteries, um, burial sites like Gloria and Saldivas burial sites, um, uh, colonial cemeteries uh, um, and also sites where, forensic, where current forensic recovery operations have been sort of conducted. Um, and, uh, and where anthropologists who exhumed the unidentified mass graves containing countless migrant bodies who lost their lives in attempt to evade the US border patrol checkpoints. Um, my interest in this wasn't necessarily an anguish decision to sort of find my grandfather's brother or to claim his unidentified body, but it was more to find a sort of testimony, testimony within the landscape. Um, so I sort of collected these materials from the land, clay, uh, uh, mud, um, uh, 
vulture feathers that were around these sites and I sort of brought these materials and uh, constructed this sort of uh, sarcophagus um, that I titled. Um, it's a six foot um, sculpture piece. Um, and this is just kind of like the direction of the piece that we want to do. Um, but instead of an, in an exhibition space, uh, sort of put it out in, into the South Texas land landscape. Uh, ne ne next slide, please. So this is a little bit of, again, my background. Um, after going to South Texas, I uh, decided to get training in human remains recovery, which is a sort of a forensic anthropology center located here in Texas, uh, where most of the operations of exhuming migrant remains are done. Um, so a lot of these processes that I learned are kind of like the direction of where um, sort of influence the type of work in terms of uh, land sites, um, materials, um, uh, excavating and, and, and burial sites. So it's, it will be like a sort of performative process and we'll document this um, as well. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so um, this slide and the one following there are just a collection of visuals from um, our time spent down in uh, in South Texas, specifically around near around Falfurias Brooks County. Um, and just to talk a little bit about some of them, like um, that photograph that you kind of see in the bottom left is, is a kind of, um, it's above a fireplace altar where there's like a list of um, the, the migrant remains that have been found just in 2020. So I think there was, there was around 100 um, last year, which is the lowest it's been um, in quite some time um, because of Trump's policy of, um, of, of keeping migrants in Mexico and really just, um, just skipping along through, through most of the bureaucratic process of, of say like um, seeing if migrants actually um, are running away from like cartel violence or just through that whole process was totally skipped and the migrants were kept in Mexico. Um, but we're anticipating those numbers to come back up again since Trump is out of office. And so, um, and what you can see too is in, in a lot of those um, are actually like unidentified remains. So quite a few of them are, and this, um, policy it was uh, begun through prevention through deterrence, mainly through um, the Obama administration. So it's been going on for quite a while now. And um, also some other images in this is like on the top left there is from the shrine of Pedro Jaramillo, who was a curandero in the 19th century in the area. And um, and some of the, and that picture, like number nine, if you can see right there, is also like a collection of, of of prayers that people leave behind for for the dead and the sick. And um, I think you can go to the next slide. Yeah, and also in the area there is um, a detention uh, migrant detention center in Falfurias, and. We're hoping to get access there too and maybe conduct some interviews um, with some of the migrants detained there and seeing their experiences and also um, with um, other people involved with um, the South Texas Human Rights Center, like forensic anthropologists and journalists. Um, and it's also worth noting too that like Gloria Anzaldúa's grave is about 30 minutes from this area. So um, her writings are going to very much like inflect this work and her thinking about the dead in combination with the land and the living is um, kind of a, a communal perspective in, in that um, this isn't like a unique incident that's just happened now. Like the borderlands has had a lot of trauma occurred there, 
So we're hoping to emphasize that in our chat book as well. So yeah. And thanks. I think that's it. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Next up, we have Yurun Hong, uh, the human behind the object. Okay. Uh, can I start? Yes, you can, Yurun. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Yurun Huang. I grew up in Taiwan. My art um, touch on the issues such as imposed identity and the need of sense of belongings. Um, can I have first slide? 16 years ago, I start a project. I ask people from all background to choose words from their life experience. People, people wrote those words by hand onto a printed shape of human body that is incorporated into a installation or into object that carry a metaphoric implications. They later discovered their work as part of our work. This project enabled art to um, serve as a meeting place for sharing and exploring our humanity. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, well, I place people's words on a talking lantern. You see, when an object glow in dark, you see it in new light. When a word glows in dark, it talks back from afar. So this contemporary light Lego pieces of is uh, a collaboration with designer David Tai is sponsored by City of Houston through Houston Art Alliance. It's placed in Houston Taiwanese Community Center. Next place. The talking door stems from the idea that new experience can be represented by a door. This is a collaboration with Texas French uh, Alliance for Arts Open the Door Project is located in a Vietnamese American War Memorial. It's a shopping mall. Okay, um, this the one side of the door is a painting of the war. The other side of the painting is the echoes of language. The complex complexity of languages and ideologies in a new place after the war. Next, please. Time in the Thai Pool is a community built ongoing mural project. It's about life impact by force from afar and the evolution. You see gravity from the moon trapped creatures in a Thai Pool where adaptation is the key to the survival. Very much like you know, from far away places, a war caused human migration, create immigration and refugee community here. I'm covering the mural with words and imagery in evoking the abundance of human experience. To the right, you can see artworks from Taiwan, ranging from native tribal art to the Pokemon in the night market. To the left, you can see imagery with the same topic, but created by people other than Taiwanese, ranging from the prehistoric Egyptian to NASA to artists in Houston, like Mario Mori or my friend, Christy Jadik. Next, please. Uh, the human behind the object. After placing people's handwritings onto a door, a lantern, you know, a toy puzzle and kite. I place people's words onto chopsticks. Why chopstick? In the world of fork and knife, chopsticks juggle two parts in one hand. Immigrants know the feeling is cross-cultural experience. But you ask any working mom, she juggle two sticks in one hand all the time. So 
Instead of words, the mural project invite immigrants to write digits such as 19 something, 20 something. Somebody wrote also in the corner, it's not show here, it's not, it's, you know, 19, 30 something. Representing the digit of years significance to them in their life as immigrants. They roll such digit onto an old chopstick and submit it to the project as found object for the mural. In the 16 foot mural image surrounded by perpetual flowing waves, the immigrant can find the chopstick flowing along the current in the mural title, Time in the Tide Pool. After showing people's work as part of our work, we will host events so people can find their, their time in their Tide Pool. And there are words on the mural too, represent as a question and a suggestion. The suggestion is by John Stanbeck to suggest people to take a journey from the tide pool to the star and back to the tide pool. And the question reads, will your motherland be always on the other side of the ocean? It's a question for all children of the immigrant. For Taiwanese community, I repeat the same question in five different ways of writing system, reflecting the issue of imposed identity in our history. So the project human behind the object, how many humans after years, like over 200, how many objects? I've shown you some and you know, more than 100 chopsticks, kites, toys, and, um, but for the project title, the human behind the object, the most important human is the viewer self. So I will work on that. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Yuru. Okay, next up, we have the Houston Collective. Uh, with members Isaac Caro Cushion, uh, Violet Vu, Felicia Chapman, uh, Maria Macias, Lindsay uh, Bethes Beth Nunes, and Joseph Pierre, or Pierre, uh, and excuse my pronunciation, the Houston Collective. Hello, everybody. Uh, we're the Houston Collective, and uh, we started the collective from a workshop that Violette Boule made in TransArt uh, last year in 2020. Uh, she has done this series of workshops called The Uncomfortable Staging internationally. And um, this time, uh, members of, of the Houston Collective now were participants and decided to coalesce once more to do a Miss and Send drive through exhibit around Houston. Next slide, please. And now we will all present ourselves. Betsa. Good evening, my name is Lindsay Betsa Beth Nunez. It's, um, it's more than a pleasure to be here with you guys in this collective. Hope you guys enjoy our presentation. Felicia. Felicia, are you with us? Um, she's been having problems with her connection. Um, Felicia Chapman, um, one of our members, um, and I'm Aysen Karachasin. Uh, I'm an artist and a technologist, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you for the opportunity, and we're um, very grateful to have received an award. Joe? My name's uh, Joseph Pierre. I'm really excited at the opportunity. I wanted to thank the Idea Fund. And um, I guess my camera might be on now. Um, just wanted to say hey. Okay. Maria. Hello, I'm Maria Macias. I'm a student at the University of Houston. And um, thank you so much for choosing us. Um, 
I think uh, Felicia is there. Okay. Saw her, but I think, are you there, Felicia? Are you muted, maybe? Yeah, I'm here. So hey, everybody, I'm Felicia Chapman. Grateful to be here um, and with the Houston Collective. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm Violet Bulle, and um, we are Houston Collective, and we are honored to be part of this cycle. Thank you so much. Next slide, please. Um, so the project, uh, the idea and the goal kind of surged from this uh, uncomfortable staging workshop, as I was mentioning. Um, but we decided that we should engage our communities around Houston and highlight the diversity of culture, geography, thought, heritage that we have um, in five different neighborhoods um, where we're gonna capture their essence, their issues, their data points, their stories, um, you know, who's the best dancer, things like this and exhibit them as photo murals of photo um, of miss and send workshops that we will have in each of these neighborhoods that will then serve um, as a way for self reflection um, through a drive through exhibit that um, will have an interactive map online that also captures audio clips and images that as we collect and spend time in each of these neighborhoods. Next slide please. Felicia, are you still with us? Okay. Yeah, I'm still with y'all. Um, it's just a lot. Okay, so uh, we are going to do uh, and focus on five different neighborhoods. So East End, Third Ward, Montrose, A Leaf, and Downtown. We specifically chose these communities because they are very uh, diverse as well as historical communities in the Houston area. And so we're wanting to focus our time and our efforts on uh, a lot of these communities with me being from A Leaf, uh, a uh, very proud uh, Southwest Ailey, Texas person. So I am happy to kind of highlight and show some of the ways that my community has been very involved. So next slide. Uh, so our timeline are broken up into three phases. The first phase is uh, between now and June, we're just doing a lot of data collection and cultural engagement um, by putting up uh, different surveys and posts around the communities in these neighborhoods to kind of get people engaged as to what do they want their community and neighborhoods to be um, known for and how they want to be highlighted and spotlighted for. Uh, phase two is from June to October. Uh, this is our me and scene photography installation as well as web development. And then phase three will be from October to December, uh, our photo mural drive through exhibit, which will allow people to engage with other communities and neighborhoods um, through our installations around Houston. And the next slide. And we will do a lot of our data collection uh, in four different unique ways. So the first being ethnic through looking uh, through DNA, language, as well as um, gastronomy. So looking through these different ways so that we can see the ethnicity uh, diversity in a community, as well as uh, census data, um, doing looking at the food accessibility, the cell phone network, uh, and so forth. I think all of these things are very important so that we can really understand the communities and who we are looking at. Uh, the third being social and the fourth being envir environmental. So all of this data collection is happening now and we're just really trying to dive deep in getting an understand of the people, the cultures um, and how they want to be represented and show up uh, in this very diverse city. Thank you. And the next slide. Hello. Um, so one of the main ideas of our Houston project is the community engagement. So we want you, the viewer, to get to know the different communities in the Houston area and what makes each of them so unique. We will be doing this by diving deep into the diversity within the communities. Um, next slide, please. 
And as you can see, this is our mission scene workshop photography, the uncomfortable staging. And this was a workshop hosted by Violet, where she taught us the importance of an image. Not only can photography create beautiful images, but they can also have a deeper meaning within them. A way that we will be collecting information is through photography, through, sorry, photographs. <laughs> and we will be collecting the pictures within the different community areas, not only to depict the beauty of the communities, but also show what makes each of them so unique and different, and most importantly, so diverse. Next slide, please. So our overall goal is to um, create a drive-through exhibit for Houston. Um, we'll be able to engage um, with the people around the city, um, giving them, providing them a digital map for them to go ahead and be able to see the mural. That's going to be incorporating all of the data that we'll be collecting throughout all of these months. Um, like I said, to overall create a drive-through. Um, Mural exhibit in each of these communities that we've been working with for them to over have like a picture of one well, the mural that will be explaining, like I said, all the data, the social actions, the data visualizations, we'll have um, driving, just them driving through, being able to check it out and um, see what they think of that. All of the data we collect, we'll be having um, a lot of engagement with the people. So a lot of the things that will be in the murals, we based off the people themselves, which comes with the social actions, like I said, the data visualizations, the environment, um, talent in the environment, in the community, sorry. And yeah, just overall, give Houston um, the chance to be able to see uh, in each community of theirs, a photo mural explaining, just by looking at a picture, what's going on in that community. Um, any problems, the good things, and just overall everything that explains that community. Thank you, next slide. So thank you very much. We are very excited. Um, if you have any questions or ideas or want to be part, live in any of these neighborhoods and want to be part of our data collection or want to tell us a story or who you know the best dancer is in your neighborhood, um, please let us know at any of our um, 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 Instagram accounts. We're all kind of you know, coalescing with each other's um, Instagram accounts. We don't have one specific, so, but thank you very much. Thank you, Houston uh, Collective. Um, so now we're gonna take just a brief uh, interlude um, for those of you all that have been asking about taking a short pause for a break. Uh, we'll come back in five minutes. Um, so at 8.03, um, or sorry, 8 yeah, 8.03, please come back and we'll resume our presentations with uh, Vinod Hobson uh, and those who desire.
All right, everybody, let's go ahead and uh, come back. And Linda, can you go ahead and load the node slides? When you're ready, you're good to go. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, just want to start off by saying thank you uh, to the Idea Fund and the jurors behind it. And uh, thank you to my fellow grantees. It's uh, really wonderful to be in great company. Um, my project is called um, On Los Brazos de Dios. Um, it's an extension of, uh, of a project I've been doing for a number of years. Um, Texas has over 80,000 miles of waterways, including its lakes and bayous, um, creeks and rivers. Uh, many of them have become iconic. Of course, we have the Rio Grande or the Rio Bravo in the west, um, the Sabine in the east, the Colorado, uh, which runs through Austin, the Trinity in Dallas. Uh, and then of course, the one that we all know probably most intimately uh, the bayous of Houston, particularly Buffalo Bayou, uh, the central waterway of the city, and the one we all learn uh, is so tied to the city's founding. It is, after all, uh, the river that the Allen brothers stepped out of their boat, um, and voila, uh, from it uh, sprang the city like Aphrodite from the sea foam. Um, but I make an argument that there is a river that is perhaps less iconic, uh, but more important culturally, politically, economically, um, to the state of Texas, the city of Houston, and in a lot of ways, the American West in general. Uh, and that's the Brazos River, which is the subject of um, the project. Next slide, please. Um, so some background on me, as I said, this is an extension of a project I began five years ago called Those Who Desire, uh, funded very generously through the Idea Fund, in fact, initiated and launched um, with their support. Um, the project grew out of uh, my experience with performance art and a personal interest in research uh, and history. And so the melding of the two, from the melding of the two of them um, came the, the project. Um, they're the product of uh, research that I'm doing, primary research and secondary research. Um, that is really, I hope to expand the understanding and reach of these histories. Um, they're primarily um, BIPOC histories, which may explain um, some of the reasons why they're lost uh, and ignored. In truth, they're more often suppressed more than anything. Um, so I think that a lot of the history I'm examining uh, has a, a lot of resonance with today. Uh, that, of course, is the um, one of the weights of history is that if it's not studied, uh, it tends to hang around and um, impact. Uh, over the course of the last five years, I've done tours in downtown um, of Freedmanstown and uh, most extensively the 1917 Camp Logan Uprising. Um, this tour will be uh, focused on the Brazos River um, and specifically I'm hoping to be able to do a tour on the river itself uh, via boat. So I've got my fingers crossed that the pandemic will get to a point where we can do this safely and that the river is still navigable by boat. Slide, please. Um, I will be focusing on uh, a section of uh, the Brazos known as the Brazos Valley right now by most people that's Northwest of Houston um, and to the border between Brazos County, Washington County, Waller County, Grimes County. Um, it, is uh, very close to College Station and um, Prairie View a and It's the section of the river there. Um, of course, the Brazos is known as the Brazos uh, today. Uh, the original name, that's a shortened version of the original name, which is Rio de los Brazos de Dios, the river of the arms of God. That's the uh, origin of the title. Um, and that was named because it was just discovered, quote unquote, by Spanish explorers um, just at the point at which they were running out of water. And so they saw it as a godsend. Um, and uh, those 
loving arms uh, have welcomed a lot of people over the years, um, including many of the earliest settlers, Spanish explorers, French explorers, pirates, um, and then of course, most consequentially, uh, Anglo settlers from Stephen F. Austin's colony. Um, that group known historically as the old 300 are really the reason that anybody lives in Texas today. I think that uh, that Anglo expansion into um, Texas and all of the things that they brought with them are the reason that any of us are here. It was uh, the money that was made along the banks of the Brazos are what funded the founding of the city. It's what made the first millionaires. It uh, is the reason the city's here long before oil or technology or medicine uh, was agriculture from the Brazos that uh, started everything. Next slide, please. Uh, among Austin's colonists, this is just one of the stories I intend um, to talk about, but I, I'll mention one of them. Um, the wealthiest of Austin's colonists uh, was this man, a man named Jared Grochi. Um, he arrived in 1822 from Alabama uh, with about 100 slaves. Uh, and those were the first or among the very first black slaves brought to Texas. Um, certainly it was the largest number of slaves brought to the state. And uh, Grochi established the first cotton plantation in Texas. Um, that is the first commercial cotton crop. And he built the first cotton gin. Cotton, uh, which of course is so tied to, history, uh, to Texas history. It was for many years called King Cotton. Um, it was the, the uh, cash crop with sugar. Both of those were grown on the banks of the Brazos. Um, both of them are tied to that. And uh, I want to point out the uh, rather ignominious anniversary that we're approaching next year, which is 200 years uh, since slavery came to Texas. Um, I think it's important to, to mention also that when Grochi brought the slaves to Texas um, was at a time when actually slavery was banned uh, in the region. Slavery had been uh, allowed under Spanish rule but of course, uh, Texas was under Mexican rule by the time they uh, got here. So um, I'm running out of time. I'm just gonna, next slide please. Just mention a few of the things that uh, other stories I'll be telling, um, you know, focused on uh, relations with indigenous people, including um, the two groups of people that have been cited so far this evening, the Karankawa and the Ishak. Um, the connections between the Brazos River and Freedmanstown. Um, these two photos, uh, Wright Cuny on the bottom uh, was born on the Brazos. He's the namesake for Cuny Holmes in the Third Ward, uh, a very prominent political leader, a black political leader um, in the area, era of reconstruction. Um, and Mance Lips Lipscomb is the other photo at the top there, who was uh, one of the great blues musicians who came out of the valley. So, be focused on a lot of uh, different history, hopefully not all uh, histories of trauma, um, but um, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vinod. Um, so next up, we will have uh, Bria Lauren. Um, Bria, whenever you're ready. Hello. Um, I want to first thank the Idea Fund um, and really the, the arts in Houston period for really pulling up um, in 2020 um, and supporting a lot of artists, including everyone here. So thank you. Um, Goals Made for Her is a subsidiary of Mercy, um, a film journal that I created back in 2018. Um, the heartbeat of my work has always centered around storytelling, um, queer people of color, Black women, and motherhood. Um, back in 2018, I knew that I wanted to continue to elevate um, the stories that I related to um, and the people around me. But 2020, 2019, going into 2020, 
um, was a big year of reflection for me. And so I began to think about um, who I was as a black woman, um, how I moved about the world, why I moved about the world, um, specifically in the arts. Um, I grew up in Third Ward. Um, you know, when I think about graduating, being at Jack Yates, you know, we were really grown to um, learn how to move about the world, um, grooming us to code switch pretty much, um, for lack of better words. And um, 2020 was a year of me really thinking about how that affected my psyche, um, how it affected the work that I talked about, how it affected um, how I showed up in art spaces. Um, and so Brianna Taylor, the death of Brianna Taylor really hit home for me um, because I thought about how Brianna Taylor could have been myself, could have been the women that I know and love. Um, and 2020 was also a big year of me diving into hood feminism by Mickey Kendall, um, who helped give me language um, and to support the anger um, and sadness that I felt about the existence of Black hood women. Um, this work is to really honor and focus on a subgroup. You can go to the next slide. Um, a subgroup of Black women that have oft, often been either you know, used for mockery, um, dehumanized because we've been taught in America that there is um, respectability politics. There is a system that Black women have to adhere to to be able to be respected, to be able to survive. And when I think about you know, growing up in Third Ward and how I look at what the women around me, including my mother, the lengths that they had to go through to be able to get the bare minimum. That was because they didn't co-switch. They didn't, you know, step outside of um, themselves, really their, their complete and honest autonomy. Um, and with that comes a lack of equity, a lack of opportunity, a lack of resources. Um, and I also began to reflect on when I would see, you know, definitely in Houston, Third Award is a really hot commodity to where um, photographers, filmmakers, artists love to um, come to. I think it's beautiful um, that people um, love to document that area. But I've noticed that a lot of times when I've seen Black hood women, you know, Black hood aunties, grannies, the culture that is rooted in that community um, is often documented from a safe distance. Um, and when we see these people in art spaces, we don't see them there. And I have a problem with that. Um, so go on to the, the next slide. So um, yeah, Go Was Made For Her is a, a visual poem um, to Breonna Taylor to Black hood women, um, period, everywhere, um, for us to be celebrated um, and also to, you know, have the conversation of why this even matters, you know? Um, why, what does it mean to be a Black hood, to be a Black hood woman? What does it mean to exist um, within ourselves, to exist within the communities um, and for us to no longer be um, a subject for someone to want to photograph um, and document. But um, a really important take for me is that all the women that you will see in this work um, are women that I know, women that I break bread with, women that I love, um, women that I've met by way of another Black woman that I love. Um, and I hope to create an exhibition um, when I debut this work in 2021, um, I want to decolonize what, you know, what does it mean to have um, an exhibition um, that is centered for Black hood women. Um, and I hope to use Mickey Kendall's um, hood feminism text as a um, reference to kind of have like a hood Bible study. <laughs> so to speak. Um, but yeah, as, as it continues to unfold, you can go to the, the last slide. Um, as all of this continues to come together, um, I'll be sharing it online through my social media. Um, and I'm really excited, you know? The Black Hood Woman is a rose and that's on period. Um, and I hope to continue to um, 
yeah, continue this narrative, continue the narratives of Black Hood women um, and communicate that through medium format, through film um, and storytelling. So yeah, <laughs> thank y'all. Thank you, Bria. Um, next up we have Prince Voorhees Thomas and Britt, oh, sorry. Next up we have Henry G. Sanchez, uh, Thank you, everyone. Um, I want to thank all my fellow grantees and everybody working on the Idea Fund. I'm Henry G. Sanchez. Um, next slide, please. So my project is a video art project called Todos, or Everyone. Todos is a project about how people can contribute to the civic dialogue of what it means to have citizenship and what patriotism means. Now on the top, you'll see classical terms such as liberty and freedom. Uh, they originate from the social contract of the sort of traditional exchange that happens between governments and people, meaning that the governments provide protection, uh, rights, freedom, and in exchange, the people have to accept responsibilities, pledge loyalty and duty. But on the bottom, you will see new terms that contemporary philosophers and theorists say introduce a more internal political aspirations such as respect and imagination and emotions and not mentioned here, love. So what these are, are supposed to be are expected basic human and civil rights. These are words that create a fulfilled sense of citizenship with human dignity as a central value for how we think of terms such as citizen and patriot. Next slide. So Todos is a new iteration of a previous project called Patriot Game, which was first shown at Civic TV in 2018. I video recorded a word game with fellow members of United We Dream, who are also DACA members. The participants sat in front of a, on a chair in front of a camera, the words flash for 10 seconds underneath, and I would record them. People could respond in any way they wanted. They could respond in an explanation with one word or gesture. They interpreted the words themselves and dissected its meaning. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna listen and watch a movie for the next three minutes, and then I'll speak after. Freedom, freedom to express who you are, who you love, and who you want to be. Friendships, connections that you make with the people you love, connections that make you strive to success. That's something we value, something we treasure, something that only comes once in a lifetime and it's honest and it's true. Um, we have a choice to either continue to be marginalized or we have the choice to stand up and fight. Choice is either bad or good and choice is the thing that will, will be like the decision of your life that's going to be the plot of your life. Pray would be to worship something that's greater that's not beyond this earth or something that you like worship and are inspired. And uh, a misguided sense of history. Really misguided. No gracias.
It's your duty to fight for freedom. Reason, a reason to live, a reason to fight, a reason to not give up. Um, Imagination, one of the best things ever. Something that drives organizing. Um, wow, well, that is the everything that happened in here. Like everything, no, 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 no limits. Um, that's what imagination is. Liberty um, is stated by the, the by the right, but I feel like it's a concept of. Uh, being free. Next slide, please. So Tonos starts as a word game, but it becomes a chance for people living within the borders of this country to reinterpret the terms and definitions so they can themselves define what it means to be a citizen. All the terms and definitions that can be combined and thought of uh, as being part of our sort of civic overall lexicon. So todas will be directed to the Hispanic, Latino, AX, Mexican American, and Spanish speaking population here in the East End. It's a bilingual project with translations. However, this project is open to all Houstonians. Thank you. Thank you, Henry, so much. Next up, we have Prince uh, Voorhees Thomas and Britt Thomas with two post cinemas for cinema. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to, Britt and I would like to thank everyone uh, for spending some of their evening with us all. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, like all the other awardees, Britt and I are both artists. And when COVID hit, all our external art activities stopped like most of the rest of the world. And amplifying this was right as the city of Houston was shutting down, we lost one of our closest friends in the world. And in the subsequent time since then, we've lost family members, loved ones, like uh, many of you out there, and we've been in our own sorts of personal hells. Next slide, please. As we were dealing with the social isolation and the shutting down of art related activities, we started thinking about how we could contribute and engage our community in socially distant ways with art. We realized that the one asset that we had was our physical location. Our backyard faces the parking lot of TC Jester Park. This park is an intersectional hub for a wide spectrum of economic and culturally diverse communities. From these initial considerations germinated the idea for two post cinema. Next slide, please. Two post cinema is a neighborhood outdoor cinema that will debut in fall 2021. This image is a conceptualized rendering of how we intend the cinema to be seen from the parking lot of TC Jester Park in Northwest Houston. Our goal with this project is to showcase video art and films from artists and filmmakers in underrepresented communities in a safe, socially distant manner that can be sustained through this pandemic and beyond. The projection will be rear projected from our backyard 
and we will be utilizing a radio transmitter for sound so that the audience can stay safely in their cars and listen through their car radios. Next, please. In designing a screen structure, there were a number of obstacles we had to uh, design around. Uh, first, we need to be able to dismantle the screen in order to adhere to the homeowners association rules. Uh, second, we needed the screen's frame to be structurally sound. Uh, this goes without saying, but with a 10 and a half by 18 foot screen elevated on poles that will reach 20 feet in the air, uh, the projection screen would act like a giant sail uh, and easily succumb to wind. So we needed structural integrity to keep it secure. And then lastly, we needed the process of installing, raising, lowering, and deinstalling the screen to be manageable by two people, Prince and I. In order to meet our needs, we decided to consult with a friend and fellow artist, Patrick Renner, on the design and fabrication of a screen structure. This animation reflects the screen structure design, showing how it will be able to collapse and hide behind our fence when it's not in use. Next, please. Our intention is to cast a wide accessible net when curating screenings and events for Two Post Cinema. In order to accomplish this, we've created an online submission form with no fees in order for artists to submit their videos, films, and projects for possible screenings and events. We will also be paying each participating artist a small honorarium if we include their work in a screening. We have not set themes for this fall's events. Instead, we are waiting to view the submissions to see what types of themes emerge. If you're interested in showing at Two Post Cinema, we encourage you to submit and uh, share with anyone who might be interested. The submission form can be accessed through our project's Instagram page. Our Instagram handle is at Two Post Cinema, two being the number two. Uh, click on the link in our bio uh, on our Instagram page and then click submission form. Uh, I recommend doing this on a computer versus a cell phone just for ease. And while you're on our Instagram page, uh, please follow us and stay up to date with our progress as well as any future events. Next, please. Uh, we'd like to take this moment simply to congratulate all the other awardees. And we'd also like to thank the Idea Fund and jurors for selecting this project. And we look forward to viewing the work that artists will be submitting and sharing it with our community. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much, Prince and Britt. Uh, and next up and last but not least, uh, Perga Rajiria and uh, Olivia Olivia. I'm so sorry for your last name. <laughs> <laughs> totally fine. Um, hi, we are Two Dykes and a Knife. Uh, I'm Prithika Rajgaria and Love you, Olivia. And um, I'll start off by talking briefly about our background. We, Two Decks and a Knife was conceived in 2017. And basically as two vegetarians who came together um, over meals, um, we started to realize that we were having some really interesting conversations amongst ourselves as uh, since we're from such different economic backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds. And um, we just found these conversations to be really interesting and healing and thought, how could we bring this um, to like a bigger scale? So how can we share this and have these conversations on a larger, larger scale? Um, so we kind of took food as social practice and uh, started creating a curated dinners with uh, curated uh, participants and the series of pictures, uh, go ahead and the first slide, please. Um, the images that we have are from a dinner that we did in 2019 um, in the fall. So um, that's a funny, <laughs> that's a text. I just saw the chat, sorry, that's distracting. Um, um, 
the pictures are all old and they're from the dinner and it's all really yummy food. So I hope y'all have uh, not eaten yet. Maybe you're about to eat after this. Next slide, please. Go ahead. So, um, <clears throat> our shared theory is that the dining table uh, is a plentiful site uh, and a platform for copious intersections, be it race, class, religious beliefs, orientation. Um, food is a necessary nourishment um, that is un that unintentionally unites people. Um, we, um, as as two visual artists, kind of have our separate practices, and this food experience has been amazing because it's sort of where we come together. Um, because if we collaborated on visual art, we would probably hurt each other. <laughs> but somehow, in the kitchen, is a very peaceful, very orchestrated, and and tends to be choreographed very well. So we were like, this will be an exciting way to start engaging people. Um, and then we had a couple of dinners planned around the country and then during like 2020, yeah. during 2020 and of course like everybody else who has received um this grant we were hit by the pandemic and our experiences and our ideas around getting food to people changed so once we realized that we couldn't get pe get people into one space uh, which we typically like to show the work in museums galleries places white wall spaces where we could sort of insert our language around um, food, politics, and art. Um, we realized that we couldn't do that. So our idea for this particular grant, um, tongue in cheek, is kind of a play on words um, or a play on, on a, an idiom, which is basically like a, the idea of having a, a conversation is very important, but candidly speaking about it humorously so that, you know, we can sort of get around all of our urges to be uncomfortable. Next um, slide, please. Next slide. You want to go more? Yeah. Where did you leave off? <laughs> okay. Um, so again, for this grant, since we can't have uh, something in person, we will be uh, arranging uh, food delivery, like food kits to about 10-ish households on a certain date. Um, unboxing packages and kind of like receiving stuff by mail or delivery has become really like exciting for social media, but also just in our day-to-day -day culture since like all of 2020 was mail and, you know, uh, delivered things, uh, safe delivery and, uh, or what do you call it? Contactless delivery. Exactly. So um, we thought that we could incorporate our visual art interests into like an unboxing of sorts or an or a big reveal. And then the other thing is we'll have like multi-course meals that are packaged and delivered. And this time the participants have to kind of create their own plate. We are definitely like sticklers, like we have fun with plating and that's like part of the joy of uh, a culinary event with us and this time we can't do it. So it's kind of like a, a co-curatorial experience. Yeah, so they bring their own twist. And, and then of course, the um the actual dinner will will be a zoom instead of being able to have these conversations in public which is a big part of like each course being uh served with a with a prompt between these 10 strangers um we'll have the conversation with everybody uh over zoom so over like a platform like this because it's zoom duh. and uh <laughs> Uh, they'll get to have like a nailed it experience. So we'll be borrowing from Nicole Byer a little bit. And well, now you're saying, this is food nerdism. So I don't know. I how know. Many... <laughs> like, super nerds about food. So yeah. when it comes to nailed it, uh, there's a show on Netflix where people think... attempt to make food um, according to the way it was displayed or introduced to them. And oftentimes the cook is not experienced. So they you know, end up making a failed attempt at making something beautiful, but we're hoping that no, it's gonna um, be great. with our lottery, a lot of people that are actually recipients of this grant also will possibly get a box. Um, and the box is also a piece of art. So it's a sculptural mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. uh, it's oh, a, next slide. <laughs> it's a finalized um, 
result and hopefully it's a chance for us all to get together, have a dinner in separate spaces, but similar experiences and we can kind of all get to the meat of the matter and start breaking Ooh, down sort of what we, so there's no yeah. meat. So no meat. <laughs> Um, but also like what we've all sort of experienced and, and, and hopefully it's a it's an easy way to talk about uh, difficult subject matters. Um, yeah, and I hope I hope that that makes sense, much. I think. Yeah. Cheers. Mm -hmm. We're excited. Hi again. So that was the perfect way to close out the presentations. I know I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, thank you everyone for coming and for um, listening to all of these presentations. Congratulations to all the artists. Um, we can't wait to see what you do. Um, and we want to, um, normally we have this event and the Aurora Picture Shows um, uh, space. And at the end of it, we always take a photograph of all the awardees. Um, so since we can't do that, we thought if all the awardees could please, if you guys could all turn on your video, um, we'll try to take a screen capture and, um, and have a type of a group photo, or at least a, a, a COVID edition of a group photo. But thank you um, to everybody who came. We really appreciate it. We have a countdown. Ready? One, two... Three and there we go. I'll do one more. Ready? One, two, sorry. And three. <laughs> All right, I got two. Camilla, you got oh, some? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope everyone has a great night. And congratulations as well. Yes, congratulations, everyone. We're so excited. Oh, um, this is so cute. Look at that lady. We will follow up with emails about next steps. Thank you all. Good night. Be safe. Oh, thank you so it's much. It's an honor to um, be awarded with y'all. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Congratulations. Have a good night. Bye. Good night. Bye bye. Bye. Congratulations, everyone. Good night. Congratulations. Thank you. Now, have okay. Nice to meet you.